Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Mystery Theory. Today, we're gonna cover a case that was requested, and take us all the way to Washington State, pretty close to the Canadian border. If you're new around here, Wednesdays, I try to do a soft spoken video. And for those of you who don't like it and enjoy whispered true crime cases, don't worry, every Monday and Friday there's a new case up for you. Today, I also want to mention that there will be a new True Crime Case exclusive for Patreon. So, if you're part of the family, please check out the page and catch up with the latest. If you want to learn more about it, please check out the link. I'd appreciate your support, and if you don't want, if you just can't, I'd love for you to just give a thumbs up and leave a comment, which helps the video, and a lot more people will be recommended this case, or this video. Let's get started. I am probably gonna butcher every name, but I looked them up and didn't write the pronunciation. So, for my Canadian friends or <laughs> Northern Washington friends, please excuse me. Okanogan County was the largest county in Washington state. It is somewhat uh, along the Canadian border, and in the center of the county, there's a town by the name of Tonasket, and it's a tiny town. Not much happens there. Less than a thousand residents. Mm. And the there's this uh, is it Aina's Valley? It's nearby. It stretches for miles in each direction around it. But about Fifteen miles from this town, Dana Davis lived in a small rural home, and Dana had four children. They had a home, but they didn't have running water, no phone. And when they needed power, they had a generator. Now, for Penny Davis, her daughter, who was nine years old, she loved living there. They were near the banks of Patterson Creek. And as a country girl who enjoyed country life, she loved to go out and explore. On September 17, 1994, it was later in the afternoon, and Penny was already being playing along the river 
with her brother, who was seven years old at the time. By the evening, he returned back home, but without his sister. He said that Penny just left him there and never came back. Dana searched everywhere, up and down Patterson Creek for hours. Uh, she was using a horse and so she covered a lot of ground, but by midnight, she was not sure she was going to find her daughter without help, so she drove the 15 miles into town to report her daughter missing. This was very out of character for Penny. She knew up and down the creek, she knew the area, and she disappeared without a trace. The next morning, there was a full-scale search. Penny was a little girl, and they distributed flyers with, or pictures around, I should say, that described, or that make it easier if you didn't know her. She had blonde hair, hazel eyes, and a small scar on her right knee. She was wearing a flowery white t-shirt and purple stretch pants bright yellow stripes. They looked for her for days, even with dogs, but they couldn't find her. Dana all of a sudden remembered that once Penny skipped school with another girl. So they checked this girl's family, but sadly, Penny was not there. Police assumed that she got lost, but as the days went by and no sign of her, it was pretty clear that somebody One of the people, person from town, who was assisting this search was 24-year-old Jack Spillman. Now Jack knew Dana. They dated for a while and been on and off for the last two years. He even lived with a family for a while. And when Penny went missing, he was living about eight miles away. Now, Jack grew up in the town of Tonuskit, again, probably butcher. And he had dropped out of high school in the ninth grade. He moved around a lot. And he relied on people to give him uh, some space so he could spend the night. Police first notice him in the early morning hours the night that Penny had gone missing. Apparently,
Apparently, he was driving his black, shabby pickup truck down Patterson Creek Road. This is near to Davis's home. So police question him about what was he doing there. He said that he heard that Benny was missing and had been helping with the search. Within a few days, he was the number one suspect. He had a lengthy criminal record. Burglary, theft, assault, malicious mischief, convictions, really. But more recently, he had arrest for rape. Apparently, a year earlier, he, Jack, and another local man offered a woman a ride home from a local bar. When they were with her alone, his friend raped her while Jack held her down. I mean, what a piece of garbage you have to be to do that, but hey, that's just my opinion. And if you have to rely on somebody to help you do that, his friend was really, I think same level with this kind of piece of shit, really. I just... Uh, this kind of thing really takes me off, in case you haven't noticed. Anyways, let's move on. The woman escaped, so this piece of garbage is... We're not even strong enough to hold her down. So, Jack didn't take his turn. And she reported the attack. So, both men were arrested and charged. But she later dropped the charges. No comment. Not gonna go there. Are a few other things that have been said about this incident online, though I couldn't find any official sources, so I'm not gonna go there. But uh, if you need help, you're at something else. So, police question Jack about where he was when Penny went missing. He said he was at a party. I talked to other people that were at the party, and it was confirmed, but he had left for several hours around 5 p.m. Then he returned to the party, but he was all muddy. Nothing in his story was holding up, really. But the police had no evidence to really convict him and keep him So they just run this surveillance on him for several months. I mean out to do make a little pause here but and say how frustrating must have been and must be even today for officers to have to know all I mean know all this information yet don't have evidence and let this people pieces of garbage out on the streets doing whatever the heck they want this is just can't even put myself in their shoes because there's not much they can do. 
sometimes people get frustrated with police because of this, but suddenly, in some cases, not having the evidence is just what makes a difference. And a lot of times, they commit other crimes <laughs> that actually convict these people. But how, how mean, how sad is that? Six months later, in March of 1995, five, <laughs> two hikers um, called the sheriff's department when they found a jawbone. It was in McLaughlin, 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 oh gosh, I am terrible today, Canyon. And it was 12 miles from where Penny was last seen. Found a shell shallow grave and buried just a foot below the ground was the body of a young girl. Police dug it and the level of decomposition kept the medical examiner from really determining a cause of death. They could confirm that it was the body of Penny Davis. Um, I won't blame you if you skip ahead a few seconds. I'm going to give some gruesome details that are not everything. But I think it paints a picture of the kind of pieces of garbage we're talking about. Or a piece of garbage. was eviscerated. She was cut open from her vagina to the chest. You could see all her organs inside. She had no clothes on. Her legs were spread. They analyzed insect activity around the body. They could tell that the grave where they found her was not the murder scene. And that she was moved there. They believe that she was buried somewhere else at least two weeks before she was moved and reburied in McLaughlin. They knew this because the jawbone had been found outside the grave. The reason, or I mean the person moving the body was unaware, according to police, that he had fallen off. So because of this mistake, the hikers found the job. It would have taken at least two weeks of decomposition for the jawbone to have fallen away from the skull that easily. Remember that they were keeping an eye on Jack Spillman, piece of garbage, in the months in the months prior, but. Just before Penny's body had been found, he had moved two hours south to Wenatchee, Washington, which is in Douglas County. Okanogan County authorities did not alert Douglas County. So, they didn't know that he was the prime suspect in an abduction 
and murder. The Douglas County Police had no idea that a murderer had moved to their county. Police informed Dana Davis that out of I think it was 150 potential suspects that all had been eliminated except Jack. Still had no evidence, but he was still the primary suspect. Police informed um, Dana of his criminal past and his prior rape accusation. But this is the kicker here. She said. Jack is the kind of person who will walk away from an argument, from an argument. But that's not the kind of person that would brutally kill somebody. I mean, for goodness sake, please. Police are telling you they had over 150 people interest and it all comes down to one one that was nearby one that knows you one that lived with you and one that your daughter would trust I don't know what kind of show this piece of garbage put for her but barely worked When Jack heard the news of Penny's body being found, he went crazy. He broke into the apartment of a woman that he knew lived with a younger daughter. While the family wasn't home, he broke into their house, took the young daughter's hamster, mutilated it with a butcher's knife from the kitchen. Then, with a bloody hamster in his hands, and I have to tell you, at this point, uh, my stomach is in my throat, and I'm being serious right now. This is not because of the hamster, but I think learning about what happened to Penny and now going through all this, it's physically making me want to throw up. <sighs> so with a bloody hamster in his hands, he spun, he spun around in a circle squeezing the hamster and spraying its blood all over the walls. <laughs> he then took the bloody butcher's knife. I, I have to take a little break, I'll be back. He then took the bloody butcher's knife, stabbed it into the head of a stuffed panda bear, and left the house. Since Jack Spillman, piece of garbage, had moved to Wenatchee, the local police received numerous reports of local women being taunted and terrorized. I mean, phone calls, attempt rape. There was this one occasion where a woman called the police couldn't stop shaking because she was terrified of this guy. He had knocked on her door, then ran around the back door and knock again, then ran to the sides, knocked all over the outside walls, 
and she was all alone. So she decided to go out for whatever reason. And he attacked her. He ran away when she kicked him in the groin. And she tore a piece of his clothing. He ran and said, I'll be back. That's not all. There was this other um, time where he was working as a roofer. Um, so we decided to just sit and stare at girls below. He was, of course, on the roof. One of the one homeowner that was having their home remodeled found the family cat this member inside the home in a similar fashion as the hamster. It was later discovered that Jack was responsible for this as well. But it, wait, there is more. He had been watching someone specific. 14-year-old Amanda or Mandy Huffman who lived with her mom, a 48-year-old. Her name is Rada Huffman. He met Rada at the tavern in East Wenatchee. She was walking through the bar towards a payphone. He grabbed her arm and they had a brief exchange of words. Apparently he was upset. Storm out of the bar. And two days after, he being a creep drove through their neighborhood, the uh, Rita's neighborhood, and watch her daughter Rita, um, Rita and her daughter. He would <laughs> sit in the bleachers or at the softball, softball games. both of them methodically for months before he made his move. On the evening of April 12, 1995, Rita's older daughter, Angie Zimmerman, who was an adult, by the way, had tried several times to call her mother, but got no answer. She called the next morning, no answer. So she drove to her mom's house. Tried the front door, but it was locked. She knew that her mom always kept the back sliding door unlocked, so she entered. She went to her mother's bedroom and what she found was a bloodbath. Um, I'm not going to give you the details because this has been one of the hardest cases to go through. I thought it was just the research, but honestly... It's so unsettling. The scene involved a baseball bat six inches inside the body. 
um, sliced the same way as Benny. The skin around that area was also cut. Her face. And even one of her breast, not Amanda's, but another one was on the chest of drawers. I mean, I don't want to paint this picture in your head as I have it in mine because it's so, there, there's details, but let's leave it there. Now, Angie was in shock. Goodness, I can't even read this, my notes myself. I can't even imagine what the daughter... Gosh, I... So she couldn't breathe. She ran from the house and into the streets screaming in terror. I, I, I mean... They called the police. And police were there for really a, a, one of the worst crime scenes they've ever seen. There was this um, sheriff gave this statement. Oh, my life fell asleep. There's evidence of sexual mutilation, but I don't know if there's been a sexual assault. This is worse than any case we've ever had. All I can say is that there was very violent trauma. There doesn't appear to be evidence of a struggle or forced entry, but our visual search has been real brief at this point. We don't want to contaminate any blood or hair fibers that might be at the scene. End quote. The body of Amanda's mother, Rita Huffman, was sprawled on the couch in the living room. Nightgown ripped off, cut, same way. Her breasts were the ones that were cut off. 31 stab wounds on her chest, arms, legs, neck, and back. It gets worse. We're gonna leave it there. Rita still wore a broken wristwatch, which had stopped at 11.35 p.m. So they assumed the watch had been broken, defending the knife attack, and stopped at that time. It was determined that cutting off the breast and some other stuff was done after they were dead. The killer had spent hours in the home with the bodies after death. Rita actually died of massive stab wounds and Amanda died of a blow to the side of her head. Which, if there is anything good in this case, I, I think it's to me comforting that this happened before all the disgusting things he did. At 2 a.m. that morning, before the bodies had been found, Jack Spillman had been parked near a dumpster when a police car approached him. As they approach him, he's, he raised his hands, but <laughs> the officer had no idea that a murder had happened. The police questioned him, thinking he was going, he was a burglar, and then let him go. The next day, when Detective 
realize that he was so close to the murder scene. They took notice, and when they went back to the dumpster, they found the kitchen knife. It was covered in blood that matched the victims. Also, the set of knives that they kept at the Huffman home. A neighbor testified seeing a black truck that matched the description of Jack Spillman's. It was parked nearby elementary school at around 11 p.m. The parking lot was in clear view of the back sliding door of the home. Jack Spillman was put under 24-hour surveillance for two weeks. While detectives gather more evidence. When police watch him put more items into a dumpster near his house, they confiscated the entire dumpster, took it to the sheriff's office. They found a bloody ski, ma- ski mask that matched the DNA of Rita. Amanda, and his own. Blood was around the mouth of the mask. Because he drank their blood. Two weeks after the murders, he was arrested. Took you long enough. Police search his home and truck and learned that he had left the gloves and clothes he was wearing during the killings on the seat of his truck. He was wearing surgical gowns at the time. He was hoping not to leave any hairs or fibers or trace of him. But they found fibers from the surgical gowns at the home. He was sent to Washington State Penitentiary at Walla Walla. And he started talking about his crime to his cellmate, Mark Miller, with details. He said he was planning to become the world's greatest serial killer. That he had done his research on serial killers. He continued to read about them in the prison's library. Which, by the way, why? Why would you keep those kind of books there? He explained how he taped the surgical gowns into his socks and gloves said in the future he would shave his entire body so he wouldn't leave any trace evidence. He was planning his future victims or murderers. He planned to remove the bed linens, burn them, or burn the house out. I mean, the guy was trying to be careful. He explained that he knocked his victims out of out with a baseball bat before doing the rest of his work. Which would explain which would explain what happened to Amanda. And there are some disgusting details about him and another guy while he was doing his thing as a serial killer. I mean, talk about crazy case. Six son of a... He also told his fantasies of inserting things into his victims, cutting... General's breast, 
drinking blood. I mean, goodness. He told Miller, his cellmate, that he thought of himself as a werewolf. And he wanted to build. And believe me, I mean, he could have done it for all we know. Because he, <laughs> with the lack of evidence and the many victims, but he was planning to build this labyrinth of underground caves. So he could keep his victims alive and torture them, really. He also explained that Penny Davis, which, you know, it comes back to that case, was not his intended target. Um, it was her friend who was 13 years old. But the girl got away from him, so he took Penny instead. He said he threw her over his shoulder, did not leave her footprints, tied her to a tree, and did all his spell. Uh, he got disappointed because he stabbed her in the stomach and died almost immediately. Thank goodness she didn't have to experience this. I can't even find a name for this. He did everything he wanted after she died. And then he placed her into the creek. But she wouldn't sink, so he buried her instead. Then exhumed the body several times to fulfill some of his fantasies. At this point, I, I don't think we need any more information about this this I mean evil doesn't even begin to describe this whatever he is his trial had been set for August of 1996 they wanted the death penalty but in order to avoid the death sentence he pleaded he pleaded guilty You receive a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole plus an extra 116 years. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, I think I'm gonna put some kind of warning in the beginning of this case or maybe even, you know, a thumbnail because... I don't think everybody is. <laughs> I don't think that most people can really take the amount of sick behavior, whatever brain he had, um, and what is the most Believe me, this case is scary, but the scariest part, I think, is the mother thinking that he was incapable of doing that to her daughter or anybody else. It's like the saying says, you know, there is no worse, uh, at least in Spanish, that's the say, you know, there is no worse blind than people who don't want to see it. And how good of an actor he must have been to convince the mother that after police going through a hundred and fifty or more suspects or people of interest, they they were down to him and she just couldn't believe it. I always say the worst kind of killers are the ones that are able to fool us all. I think that's why it's so hard for me to trust people. Because I truly believe that the worst
worst kind of criminals can get away with it for so long just because you could never believe they'd be able to do it. You just can't, you know? Nice people, humble people, hard working, or having a hard time in life. Life hasn't been fair to them. And sometimes they hide behind a suit or a tie or a presence or their power. I mean, come on. There must be something we can do when we know, we know, and we know that they did it. There must be a change. There must be, and I understand that in some cases, those suspects that seem very likely with a lot of circumstantial evidence are innocent people. But when you know this guy, I mean, he raped or, you know, was part of it before. And just because she, t- okay, she decided not to go on with the charges, we're okay with that. Are we just, are we just going to say, well, as long as she's okay with it. No. No, 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 no. I don't care if she didn't want to press charges. If there's proof that he did this against our will, it should be a matter of the state, it should be a matter of the law, and not a matter of do I want to press charges. And yes, I do understand that They need the testimony of her and that more than likely they would need a lot from her that maybe she didn't want to offer. But there must be a change in this kind of thing because after this, Penny paid with her life. Rita and her daughter paid with her lives in horrible, disgusting, the most uh, evil. No, evil doesn't begin to describe what he did. And I don't think he was mentally ill. It was never on the table. I did my research. It was never a reality for him. He was just a sick individual. But sick in an evil way. And not mentally. I've never... I mean, I've come close... You know, I have cover cases, I call her fish, another pretty disgusting um, to learn details. But my stomach was so knotted as I researched. And I initially read this in a book I mentioned several times that I've been reading more true crime cases and I have to tell you that from the first time I read about this case I had a knot in my stomach and I put myself in their shoes and I just I just can't I can't for my mental health go there anymore but sides of being an empath. Sick. I just couldn't take it anymore while I was going through this video. So, I will warn you in the beginning (laughs) that you're at the end. sit in silence and listen to the birds try to say a little prayer for you know people who 
people that have to go through this terrible things and um, hope that they never happen again. I'd be quite happy to run out of content <laughs> if it meant that these things would stop happening. Leave your comments down below. <laughs> was it as upsetting to you as it was to me? Did you feel <laughs> physically ill with this? Is it information that people need to know? Gosh, I, at this point I'm questioning myself with this. Thanks again for being here today, guys. <laughs>